Welcome to another edition of Panther Sports Talk right here on WIU. On today's program, we recap the big family weekend football win over Eastern Kentucky. Also, we talk to the head coach of the first place EIU women's soccer team. All that and much more right here on Panther Sports Talk. Production for Panther Sports Talk is brought to you in part by Johnson's Automotive Service is a proud supporter of Panther Sports on WEIU. Johnson's has alignment checks along with oil changes. Located at 800 Madison in Charleston. Johnson's Automotive Service, keeping your life running. Welcome back to Panther Sports Talk right here on WIU. I'm your host, Rich Moser, joined every week with EIU head football coach Dino Babers and coach off to a good start in the, the conference season this past weekend, family weekend, a 1-0 start to conference play. I guess you couldn't have it go any better than, than it kind of did as far as kind of getting getting the momentum going and making a statement, I guess, when you're coming out to try to defend a league championship. Well, seventh largest crowd in the history of EIU football and uh, an opportunity for a lot of guys on the football team to play in front of uh, mom and dad and family. I thought that – and and having an opportunity, obviously, to win the game and be 1-0 in conference with all those things happening, I'm not sure we could have had a better day. Now, Coach, you talked a little bit about the fact, I know in post game that you were able to get a lot of guys in there, a lot of second and third team guys. And a lot of times, they do a lot of the yeoman's work that people don't know about in practice. They're the scout team guys. They're the tackling dummies in, in drills. So you wanted to get them out there. But you got them out there a lot earlier than maybe I thought and some people in the stands thought. What was kind of the deciding moment? It was about five minutes left in the third quarter when you really started making those, those wholesale substitutions. Well, we, we, looked, we looked at the pace of the game, and uh, I thought we had a 35-point game. There was about five minutes left in the third quarter. Uh, we felt that we were going to have one or two more possessions with the win, and then uh, uh, we were going into the win. We didn't feel like uh, they were going to be able to make uh, a comeback. And uh, since I felt that the game was in hand and with the crowd being the way it was and with all the moms and dads in the family, I just, I just couldn't uh, let that opportunity go where we could put those young men out there and, and the moms and dads could watch their sons play. Now, you, you talked a little bit also in the post-game press conference about how the game unfolded and how the elements were a factor in some of the decisions you made. You guys had the ball first. You went out a very quick three and out, as you talked about. You, you even said, we went on the field, we went off the field, didn't even know we were kind of out there. And, that really changed your mindset, not only for the quarter, but maybe for the rest of the game. Well, I looked at, we were, Jimmy's arm is strong enough to throw in the wind. He's proven that he can throw the ball in the wind. That's not the issue. I was looking at what they were trying to do offensively, and they were, they had some, uh, early in the game, they had some opportunities for some big plays, and they barely missed it in the throwing game. And I said, you know what, we can't let them have five to six shots against our defense with the wind behind that quarterback. I knew that quarterback would have trouble with the win going, going into the win, and I just didn't want them to have any early success in the game. So what we tried to do is shorten the first quarter by uh, running the ball more and then getting the win with us in the second quarter and then really trying to get after them in the second quarter and, and score some points on them. Now one of the other things, that you used the word shorten there, is your defense was actually able to shorten the field for your offense. And um, we're going through the third quarter, and – by number standpoint, everybody looks at, well, Jimmy Garoppolo had a subpar day. He was actually very efficient. The fact is he really only had to work on half the field most of the day, and that's a credit to the fact that your defense set him up in good positions. Yeah, if he'd have played the whole – he was on a pace for a 440-type passing game if he'd have played the entire four quarters. But we're not going to complain at all. Four turnovers from the defense, they played marvelously. I mean, they were marvelous. Uh, Coach McLeod and his staff, I mean, great job. I just think that uh, any time that you get a short field like that with our offense, that uh, you're going to light up the scoreboard a little bit, and that's exactly what happened in the second quarter. Now you talk about the defensive effort. Two years in a row now that this team has come out and really bottlenecked and shut down Eastern Kentucky, but from maybe two different uh, mental approaches and maybe emotional approaches. Last year kind of went into Richmond as the underdog, maybe feeling a little bit of chip on their shoulder. 
different approach this year being the favorite, but still the defense came out and, and decided to show that this is a team that, that also has a defensive part of its, um, I don't even know what the right word would be there. there. There's two facets. Defense is definitely part of the facet as well. Well, you know, the, uh, Eastern Kentucky and Eastern Illinois University are the two winningest programs in the OVC. We have the most playoff appearances. We understand that we're playing a champion. I mean, there's guys in that locker room that has OVC rings, just like we have OVC rings. So, I mean, you, you really got to get up for that game. You got to really take it to them. It's going to be a physical co contest. They're going to try to run the football on us, and they're going to try to stop the run against our offense. So we know it's going to be physical. It's a challenge that we need to be able to meet yearly, and we get very excited about playing the Colonels. Now, the other things that happen in those games, kind of a record-setting day and a, and a couple facets. We'll start one on defensive end of the field to start with. Anthony Goodman returns the fumble 70 yards, longest in school history. And it was on a play that, that really took a lot longer to develop than it – I mean, at the end result, you're very happy. But I'm sure first three guys had an opportunity to get a tackle for loss and a sack, and you're like, okay, he's going to break out, he's going to break out. And then they force the fumble, Goodman picks it up and returns the other way. So you probably had a swing of emotion there just watching that play. It, it, was, very, it was a very <laughs> emotional play. I saw a missed sack. I saw a second missed sack. I saw a guy missing from behind, and the, then the quarterback skirts off to their sideline over to the left. And I see uh, Jordan Wycliffe. Came. So Jordan comes over there, and, uh, and he's ripping at the ball. And I'm like, is he going to get that thing out? And then Jordan gets the ball out, and it goes right into Robert Haynes' chest. And he bobbles and misses it, and then uh, Goodman's there for the reception, which is lucky for us because Goodman's a lot faster than Robert. Sorry, Robert. <laughs> so uh, it fell in the wrong guy's hands because he may be one, Goodman may be one of the fastest guys on our defense. And uh, I, I read an article earlier about he was a, hoping anybody was going to catch him. Nobody's going to catch Goodman from behind when he's running. So it was good for us that he got the ball and took off. And, of course, that was kind of the uh, nail in the coffin before halftime and uh, – it sent us, up, sent us into halftime on an emotional high, and I'm sure it put those guys in the other locker room on a downer. And kind of the right time, right situation for Goodman, the fact that he may not have been on the field there had the call from the week before not happened. He was in there. Alex McNulty was in there. They were kind of split in time based on the fact that Pete Houlihan had to sit out the, the first half due to the call at Northern Illinois. So those guys went in, and they responded to show that you have some guys that if a guy goes down, maybe you have some guys that can step in and give you some competent minutes. It, it, the great thing about football is that, you know, you are allowed to hurt people and sometimes people get hurt. And uh, little Petey was out because of, obviously because of the, uh, the, the helmet and, the, and all that stuff, the helmet shot. But to see Goodman come in there and get time and quality minutes and play and help to contribute, that's just a, that's just another thing to, to bring along the, the backup, so to speak, the guys that aren't on the front line guys, because those scout team players that you mentioned earlier in the show, those guys are the key to the offense. Those guys are the key to the defense. They're the key to our football team, is they give us those quality looks so that we can go out and, and put on the field the performance that we did in the first half against uh, Eastern Kentucky. So uh, they don't get their praises song enough, and uh, I'm, I was happy to see not only Goodman do that, but a lot of other guys get in the game and do good things. Now, I'm going to keep picking up on words you keep using here so you're going to give my segues. Praise, that, that's the next word we'll talk about. A kid who is the most humble kid I think I've ever seen for all the praise and accolades he gets, Jimmy Garoppolo, yet another record-setting day. Not only does he set the school record in touchdown passes, passing Tony Romo, he gets that record in the OVC as well, but he also becomes the career passing leader in the OVC with still – six, seven, eight games minimum left in the season. So who knows where his numbers are going to finish. And you ask him after the game and he acts like that, okay, I threw an interception. That's what I'm most upset about. That's a team guy if you want to describe one. Well, the interception wasn't his fault. The guy's fault knows, the guy knows whose fault it is and the whole team knows whose fault it is. And I'm not happy about it, but we're going to work on it. Uh, there's no doubt Jimmy's a humble guy. Uh, I've said it before, as he go, we go. And uh, all that stuff that he gets, he deserves. I mean, if you, see, if you watch him around campus, if you watch him around the football team, if you watch him around others, I mean, he's a very humble cat. And there's a lot of humble people on this football team, including the head coach. We know we've been blessed. But uh, any awards or any of that stuff that he gets, he rightfully deserves. And I've seen all those other guys that he's passed, and not talking about the EIU guys, but the Brockmans and all those other people in the league. 
And, you know, the record is where it should be. I mean, Jimmy Garoppolo is probably the best quarterback that's rolled through this league in a long, long time. So he should have those records. Now, the other part of the game, you guys have a bye week this week. We'll talk Austin P on next week's show. As you head into that, it'll be a next week Thursday night game. The season to date, we kind of talked about that. You guys, 4-1. and one. The only loss to Northern Illinois, a team that all along you've said should be ranked, is finally ranked in one of the polls. They moved in the 23rd. They had to thrash Purdue to get to do that. And in some people's minds, we moved, Eastern moved to fifth in the polls, partly because you beat Eastern Kentucky. But I think people that vote may now realize how good Northern Illinois is and how close we came to, to picking up a, a big win there. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that Northern Illinois is going to lose another game until they get into their bowl game. They may go into, they may run the MAC. They really may. And uh, my hat's off to them. They're an excellent football team. Uh, you know, we had them on a night. We had our opportunities. We didn't get it done, thanks to a lot of contributing factors. Would love to play them again. I think our football team would love to play them again. If we can set that bowl game up rich, <laughs> we may even be able to give you some dividends off of that. But uh, we've got to go into the playoffs. They're going to go do their deal. We wish them the best of luck. I do believe that uh, what they did to Purdue did help us because when people realize they've just, I believe they're the first MAC team to ever beat two Big Ten teams in the same season, and uh, that put another feather in our cap to how well we played them at their place, and they won those two games on the road versus the Big Ten. I think that uh, helped our credibility, so to speak, and helped to move us up in the polls. Now, you guys head into the off week here. I know there's always things that, that as a, a football coach and a football team you want to work on. Anything, the one area I guess that you guys are having to work on now is the special teams. That, that's going to be a focus. You've mentioned that that's not where you want it to be. You have a new long snapper. I think you're still having by committee, but it looks like somebody at least won the job the other day. Jake McNair went in there and I thought did a, a decent job. I, I don't you're the one that would have to evaluate that, but uh, on the, some of the things, it looked like he was kind of doing what he needed to do as an emergency fill-in. Well, it's the first time he's ever snapped in a game, and I told, I told Jake that he got a high C. <laughs> I said he got a high C, and uh, as a football team and as a, as a player, we can't settle for that. We can't settle for being average. Why in the heck would we want to be average? We weren't put here to be average. And we expect him, expect more out of him. And we'll go back, and we'll still work other guys on the football team because we need that to be an area of excellence and we need to be outstanding on that. We're not where we want to be in that department, uh, PATs and field goals, but it's a work in progress and hopefully by the time we come out of this break, maybe we can get it eliminated. I've been saying that for two or three weeks and it's still there, but uh, we're trying our best. We're working all night and all day on making sure that this thing gets right so it doesn't bite us in the butt later on in the season. All right, Coach. Well, enjoy the off week here. I know you guys will be working on some things. You'll still be practicing and moving full speed ahead. Next week, we'll talk Austin P. It'll be the second game in the OVC schedule for you guys. It'll be a Thursday night game next week. Be right back with This Week in EIU Athletics. Panther fans, here's what's going on in Panther Athletics. Panther football is now 4-1 on the season and 1-0 in the OVC after defeating Eastern Kentucky 42-7 at O'Brien Field this past Saturday. Panther Volleyball starts the OVC season 1-1. They're 7-8 overall. They lost 3-2 at Southeast Missouri State and won at UT Martin 3-0. Women's Soccer starts the OVC campaign 2-0 and they're 2-9 overall. A 1-0 win at Belmont and a 4-2 win over Tennessee Tech at Lakeside Field. Men's soccer goes 0-1-1 this past week. Their tie was at IUPUI in their Summit League opener. Men's golf finished 10th at the DePaul invite. Austin Sproles was the top EIU finisher in 10th place. Women's golf finished 8th overall at the SIU Edwardsville tournament. Tiffany Wolf was the top EIU finisher in 39th place. Men's tennis was a 6-3 winner at Missouri St. Louis. Women's tennis competed at the SIU fall tournament. And softball hosted fall games at Williams Field. Now here's what to watch for this week. On Friday, cross country is at the Notre Dame invite starting at one o'clock. Women's soccer is at Lakeside Field to take on OVC rival Moorhead State at three o'clock. And volleyball is at Lance Arena to take on OVC rival Tennessee State at seven o'clock. On Saturday, men's soccer travels to Macomb to take on Western Illinois at one o'clock. And women's rugby has a match at Davenport College at three o'clock. On Sunday, women's soccer is at Lakeside Field to take on OVC rival Eastern Kentucky at 1 o'clock, and men's and women's golf are at the Butler Fall Invite. On Monday, men's and women's golf continue action at the Butler Fall Invite. 
And on Tuesday, men's and women's golf complete their action at the Butler Fall Invite. And men's soccer is in Chicago to take on UIC at 7 o'clock. For Panther Sports Talk, I'm Ramin Kabasian. Here's the snap. Here comes the blitz. Jimmy's going to throw it deep down the middle. Laura's out there. Got it. And he's on his way. Garoppolo burns the blitz. Touchdown, Eastern Illinois. Eastern Illinois Panther football is on WEIU. EIU welcomes OBC rival Southeast Missouri State to O'Brien Field as the Panthers look to defend their conference crown. It's the Panthers and Red Hawks, October 19th at 1.30. WEIU is your home for Panther football. And welcome back to Panther Sports Talk. We're now joined by EIU women's soccer coach Jason Cherry. And, and coach, congratulations. Off to a good start in the conference season and maybe a little unexpected for some of the unfortunately bumps and bruises you guys took during the offseason. Yeah, well, it's great to start 2-0 <laughs> in conference. And uh, yeah, non-conference was a little struggle, but we were trying to figure out a lot of things. And with so many young players, I think we finally got a rhythm of who needs to be where and hopefully we can keep on building from that. Now you say that, and, and a little story for the people at home. And a couple weeks ago, Courtney Jersey, who's now the, the goal te keeper for the team, coach had, had put her in the field, and I kind of joked with him. I said, she's going to make the difference for her. She's going to win a game. She's going to score some goals. And I think I gave you three goals she was going <laughs> to score. We didn't score any goals at all that game. Little did I know that it was going to be two weeks later, you were going to put her in goal, mm -hmm. and she was going to stop 12 goals for you instead for you guys to get the shutout win at Belmont. Oh, exactly. <laughs> she was amazing. She – well, she helped us win the game. I mean, she made all the saves she had to and then made a few extra ones that I call game-changing saves and kept us in the game. And going on the road against Belmont, a team that was in the conference last conference tournament last year, it's a great win, a great nice steal win from on the road. So that was nice. Now, you, you, I know a lot of times you do non-conference schedules, and, and a lot of it you didn't do. You, you kind of inherited a team during the middle of the summer. A lot of that is used sometimes by coaches to set themselves up for a conference slate. Do you kind of – I know that's maybe not the reasoning behind it, but are there now some, some moments during the non-conference or certain teams that you're able to use as teachable moments as you head into these conference games? Oh, most definitely. We've, we had a hard schedule and opened up with a very tough team at home with Oakland. And we actually scored on them after we gave up a goal and we were in the match. And it, it just shows it that you can't stop playing. You got to keep working. And we've had a lot of those games where we've gone a half, zero, zero with someone and and then one thing happens and we kind of broke down a little bit. So it was a maturity level. We had to keep working and learn from it. And uh, it was nice to see because that Sunday against Tennessee Tech, they scored first on us. And then all of a sudden we unleashed three goals in a short period of time, which was unbelievable to see. Now, Megan Radloff, it kind of has become a little bit of an offensive spark for you there. She had two of those four goals and people have seen her. She was an all OBC newcomer a couple of years ago. Are there some other players that are, are kind of stepping up and filling that second and third spot behind her? Oh, most definitely. I mean, in attacking sense, you have Hannah Miller. She finally got her goal against Valparaiso, and then she scored this weekend against Tennessee Tech. And as a striker, once you get a goal, it's, the goal seems a lot bigger. And then hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it keeps going for us. So, and I hope with Radloff, I, it's funny with Radloff, I call her Keen. R Roy Keen, who's an Irish guy who played in the Premiership and uh, Plays really hard, hard nose, tough, and great player. And I always call her Kino. And it was nice to see her get a couple goals on her birthday. So that was that was beautiful. And then Lauren Hoppenstadt has stepped up for us. Unfortunately, she hasn't played the last two weeks because of an injury, but uh, she stepped up and really is taking charge. Now you talk about that, and I know all year long you guys have been bitten with the injury bug. I, I've been out there twice when I've seen kids go down with injuries, and a lot of times some of the times in the midst of competition sometimes just freakishly I think one girl was just making a turn with the ball and kind of caught her cleat the wrong way and was kind of done for the season you, you've lost some of those but I, I, I think you've kind of regained maybe some players that were injured early in the season that give you some depth now well we we have <laughs> and then we have it <laughs> um, there's a you know our Canadian freshman from Nova Scotia Kathleen McKinnon um, she just started playing right at the end of uh, nine conference. So I think she'll be a surprise to a lot of people in the conference. Um, unfortunately, we just lost another kid no. Sunday, <laughs> uh, possible ACL. So, and that would be her third. So hopefully that, hopefully that doesn't happen. But we've, I think we're down seven players again out of our 29 main roster. So it kind of, we get one back and then another one, unfortunately, 
it gets hurt, so. But it's good that people have stepped up there, and I, and I think girls, I, you don't ever wish somebody bad in front of you, but it, it's given some girls some opportunities to play that, that maybe you had considered not playing at all, maybe even redshirting. Yeah, and actually a lot of them stepped up. You know, the moments they have, they come in and play and make my job a lot harder. <laughs> more difficult to see who's going to play. I think uh, in the last few games, we've been more consistent with who we've played and then change up because of matchups. So like this weekend, we put Allie Lakey in the center mid, which usually she's a center back, and she ends up getting a goal and assist and just showing me that she can play anywhere, and she's willing to do that for the team, which was really nice to see. Well, good, um, good luck on that, Coach. And re reminder that the Panthers will be back in action. The first place Panthers in women's <laughs> soccer host Moorhead State in Eastern Kentucky this weekend, 3 o'clock on Friday, 1 o'clock on Sunday. Supposed to rain out there a little bit. Hopefully the weather will stay away long enough for you guys to get both your matches in. Congratulations on the great start to the season here in the conference play, Coach. And we'll be right back with some of the highlights from this past weekend's Family Weekend events that were on campus, including the football game, the big win 42 to seven over Eastern Kentucky. Thanks for watching Panther Sports Talk, everybody. And we'll be back right here next week on WEIU. From O'Brien Field on Family Weekend on the campus of Eastern Illinois University in Charleston, welcome to the Ohio Valley Conference opener. The Eastern Illinois Panthers set to take on the Colonels of Eastern Kentucky. These teams pick 1-2 in the OVC preseason poll. Eastern the preseason favorite to win the league. Eastern Kentucky number two. Here's McLean, four-man rush. He's going to throw over the middle. It's tipped and intercepted by Adam Gristick. No, it's in yes, intercepted. In and out of the hands of Watts. And Adam Gristick, Eastern linebacker from Allentown, Pennsylvania, makes the first interception of his career. Second down, three to go. Out of the shotgun, Garoppolo rolling out to his right. Pump fake, sets up, looking, throwing the bomb. Going for Gober, back of the end zone. Touchdown, Eastern Illinois. Gober in the back corner behind two defenders. Jimmy Garoppolo sets the record for Eastern Illinois and the Ohio Valley Conference with his 86th career touchdown pass, wiping Tony Romo's name out of the record book. Wide to the left borders, wide to the right, Glover. Hand off up the middle, Jew. Pop through straight ahead, good room to go with the 50. 45-40, grabbed by the jersey, ball knocked free. It's loose at the Eastern 15, and I think the Panthers got it. Jew got it poked away from behind at the 25, and Alex McCulty recovers on the second turnover by Eastern Kentucky. Fourth and goal inside the one. Here's Garofalo under center. He's going to give it to Duncan straight ahead. Dives over the top. Touchdown, Eastern Illinois. Duncan playing Superman. Went right over the top into the end zone. Third and five at the 30 for EKU. Out of the shotgun. McLean back. Looking to his left. Pressure. Grab. Sack. Down he goes. Clinton Simpkins with his second sack this year. He came in from the right side and sacked McLean around the 22. Third down and seven for Eastern at the 20 of Eastern Kentucky. There's the snap. Garoppolo back. A lot of time. Now rolling out to the right, signaling receivers to go downfield. He's going to throw into the end zone, and it is bobbling caught. Touchdown, Jeff Leapak in the back corner of the end zone. Garoppolo directing the receivers and then just threaded it back into a pretty tight window in the right corner where Leapak bobbled and held on at the pylon. Eastern has Garoppolo under center. Here's the handoff, a little flip to Laura on an end-around pass, and a touchdown to Adam Drake. No, Ryan Meyer. Eric Laura throws his second career touchdown pass as he took the flip on an end-around and then flipped the ball to Meyer in the back of the end zone for a touchdown to make it 27 to nothing. There's the snap. He's back to pass. Throws a quick one on the left. Tipped into the air. Intercepted by Gristick, his second of the day, a linebacker's dream. And yeah, that ball was tipped up in the air as it went off the hands of the intended receiver. Gristick made the interception. Out of the shotgun, McLean. There's the snap. Here comes the blitz. He's going to run. He got grabbed by Delfon and broke away from 25. Still being grabbed and breaking away, and they finally get him down and fumble. Penalty flag. Eastern picks up the fumble, and they're on their way for a touchdown. It's Anthony Goodman who picks the fumble out of the air, and he takes it all the way back for a touchdown, but we need to check out the penalty flag. McLean kept breaking tackles, and every time he broke one, there'd be another defender there for Eastern to hit him. Here comes the call. There's no foul on the play. The flag flipped out. Over on the right, three wide outs go to the left. Waist high snap, fake handoff. Garoppolo sets up, lofting it down the right sideline. Gober got it to the 15, 10, 5, touchdown. DeAndre Gober, second touchdown today. 
Garoppolo's third touchdown pass as Gober beats the defender by a step up the right sideline. May have been the exact same play as the one that Gober had to flex off his hands towards the end of the first half. That time he hauled it in in stride. And Garoppolo over 300 yards passing today. Five for five in that category now this year. And it's the 14th time he's done it in his career. Great day for Eastern Illinois. Big crowd on family weekend. They saw the Panthers put up 28 unanswered points in the second quarter to take a 35-0 halftime lead and then just kind of played out the string in the second half. EIU wins it. Final score, 42-7 over Eastern Kentucky. Eastern Kentucky. Production for Panther Sports Talk is brought to you in part by Johnson's Automotive Service is a proud supporter of Panther Sports on WEIU. Johnson's has alignment checks along with oil changes. Located at 800 Madison in Charleston. Johnson's Automotive Service, keeping your life running 